You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. What a great miracle, the Hebrew language. I mean, isn't it amazing? A language that was dead for 2,000 years, that was only read as a holy language, comes back to life with the people in the land of Israel. And not only that, I mean, it, it, it's renewed, it's growing and moving forward even today. Our generation is probably the only generation for 2,000 years that opened the Bible and understand what the Bible says yeah. in Hebrew. Yeah, we get to experience something very unique, which is the combination of the ancient and the new. Not just a biblical language, not just a holy language. It's not like reading in Latin or, you know, or in some original text. It's alive and, and moving forward today. So we, we have that combination of the ancient meaning, the biblical meaning, and the everyday use of the language. Samuel, let's go deeper into how this happened, what it took to bring this language back to life. Yes, let's watch together the Hebrew language. Right behind me is the home of Eliezer ben Yehuda, the man who almost single-handedly recreated and brought back to life the Hebrew language that we use today. And this really is a story of humble beginnings. It's a man who locked himself and his family in a home and brought back to life the words, the language, the context of what was a biblical and religious language and turned it back into a modern and everyday use language. It's a truly incredible story and it all started here. Hey guys. Hi. Thank nice you so much you. for coming. Nice to be here. Good to see you. You too, you too. My name is Liaz Raz, and I'm married to Itamar. I'm the grand grandson of Eliezer ben Yehuda. So let's say someone has never heard of Eliezer ben Yehuda. Tell us that story. Eliezer ben Yehuda uh, came to Israel on 1881. Jerusalem was a place where people were talking many different languages. Latino, Arabic, French. German, English, Turkish, anything you want. Nothing but Hebrew. Only in the prayer. Only in prayer. So people came to Israel, but they had no common language. No. So his mission was to revive the Hebrew. The people was against him because they say in Jerusalem that you shouldn't speak Hebrew. You should only pray in Hebrew. And the only people who were with him were the newcomers from Russia that understood that we will never exist if we will not have our own language. So Eliezer ben Yehuda had a big mission. The first mission was to revive the Hebrew. He needed to have thousands of new words that were not exist. Aeroplane, car, everything that we have today, nothing existed. Another problem was, how do you spread the message? There were no journals at the time. So what he did, he used to write the news, to type the news, and to take the newspaper and spread it all over. There was nobody that would do it. He did all of this himself. Yeah. He was very much a man on the mission. He was much beyond that. This man who doesn't speak Hebrew, comes to Israel and dedicates his life to creating a modern adaptation of a language that's been lost. He was a genius. He learned 12 languages in order, within two, three years, in order to be able to write his... Uh, he was a genius. He was an extreme. He was... Nothing would stop him. In order to accomplish his mission, Eliezer ben Yehuda utilized some extreme methods that are still debated today. He thought that the only way we will create Hebrew in Israel was if their children's tongue will be Hebrew. So you have to talk to your child Hebrew from the day he was born. And what he did in his first child, which was called Itamar ben Avdi, who is my grandfather, until the age of eight, was isolated in the house. So he will not hear anybody else talking English. His only friend or any other dog. language. His only friend was a dog? His only friend was a dog, yes. I mean, you're, you're a mother. This is a, a very mean thing to do to a child. Yes, it's very. You know, in, in Israeli school, in uh, elementary school, uh, people uh, hold a court for uh, Ben Yehuda with the judge and everything, if it was too much tough with him or not. A uh, mock trial. Right. Yes. And Itamar Ben Avi wrote with the time that he admired his father. And he thought that what his father did was the right thing to do in order to change. This is an incredible story. 
a hundred and something years later, we take for granted. Obviously, we speak Hebrew, we write in Hebrew, we read in Hebrew. But if it wasn't for the incredible sacrifice and insanity uh, of Eliezer ben Yehuda, this wouldn't be possible today. Eliezer just said that you can have a, a nation without a language. A nation will not exist without a language and without a land. Mm -hmm. Now the question, why not English? Why not German? The reason is that we are different. We are Jewish people, and our own identity is the Hebrew language in the town Jerusalem. So the land was Israel, and the language was Hebrew. After exploring the depths of our Hebrew language and the ongoing Jewish story, one thing is very clear to me. Hebrew, the land, and the people of Israel are all interdependent. The survival of one without the other is truly impossible. Deep down inside, there must be something religious to it, and maybe even mystical. For me, the Hebrew language is this uniting factor that binds the Jewish people together from generation to generation, and from community to community. The only way to unite the people, to bring one culture, one nation, is by having one language. This is the language of God. This is the language that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. It's a completely living language, and it's thanks to the efforts of people like Ben Yehuda who wanted to make it a reality. It's a little bit of an intro into our subject this evening, and uh, of course we're going to be pleased to ask a Professor to come forward in a moment and give us a little bit more uh, information surrounding that video clip. Um, just a little bit uh, introduction to Professor Gillard. Uh, he looks a little younger there, uh, Gillard. Um, Professor Gillard was born in Israel. He is a professor of linguistics, author of many sold books all around the world. Uh, he speaks one more language than <laughs> Ben Yehuda, 13 different languages fluently. Might have to test you out over supper on that one. Uh, 13 different languages fluently. He has attended and taught in universities all over the world, including Cambridge, Oxford, and Tel Aviv. And I believe you've got a current tenure at uni, yes, no, uh, Adelaide University, at Adelaide University and is the professor for the lost and, rec and reclaiming of languages, uh, particularly with the Aboriginal languages. Now, some of you have seen on your chairs, you've got some handouts here that would, might be interesting on the subject in hand. Also, uh, Professor Gillard's been very kind to taxpayers funded, of course. Great amount of material out here you can come and help yourself with for as well. Some of this is very interesting. Mark, you'd be interested in this. You're always out there amongst the, uh, the Aboriginal community. Um, great books here on uh, some of the languages of the Aborigines and, and how to speak their language. And that's a, another subject altogether. We're not talking about that tonight. But we are now going to ask uh, Professor Gillard to come forward and give us his address, The Miraculous Revival of the Hebrew Language, if you'll all just give him a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mike. It's such a pleasure to be invited here. It's not my first time, as Mike said. I was here with Yuval Rotem, who was the ambassador of Israel in Australia and uh, several other times. Upa, I hope it's okay here. Oh, okay. That's good. Now, this is not tax uh, fund. This is my donation, so it's after tax. <laughs> so, um, and you have some uh, booklets that might be of interest to you, including children because these are written for children too not just for adults i would like to start with a funny story that happened to me at the opera uh, here in adelaide i met somebody called philip hoban and uh, i said hoban such a beautiful name you have just like russell hoban and then i quoted i remember it by heart language is an archaeological vehicle full of the remnants of dead and living pasts. The language we speak is a whole palimpsest of human effort and history. Now, I need to explain palimpsest. Palimpsest is when you write on top of another written text. For example, you find, say, um, a book written on papyrus. You don't care about what is written there, but because papyrus is very expensive, you write your own book on top. This is palimpsest. So historians are interested in what is written behind, yeah, because this is more ancient. At this point, Philip Hoban said, you know, you are the first person in Australia who got my name correctly. Everybody thinks my name is Philip Hogan. 
Hogan, not Hoban. And he told me this story. Yesterday, I received a phone call from Optus. Would you like to upgrade your plan, Mr. Hogan? Uh, somebody from India, you know, they asked him to. So I told him, it's not Hogan, it's with a B. So they said, would you like to upgrade your plan, Mr. Bogan? <laughs> of course, being in India, they had no idea about the word Bogan. So they said, ah, oh, yeah, you're in India, you're not in Australia, don't you? <laughs> I would like to tell you that language is at the very heart of Zionism, and I would argue that the most successful enterprise of Zionism, other than to have Jews in Zion, is the revived Hebrew language. So it's, the, it's a success story. I give you a little bit of background here. Hebrew is currently the only official language of Israel and is spoken to varying degrees of fluency by its 9.5 million citizens. We have 9.5 million citizens. I remember, as a, I remember it was 3 million, but now it's 9.5. It's a mother tongue by most Jews, of course not all Jews, because some of them come from Russia or Soviet Union recently, even from the Ukraine right now. They don't speak Hebrew as a mother tongue. They speak Hebrew as a foreign language, just like I speak English as a foreign language. And there's a second language by Muslims, Arabic speakers, Christians, for example, Russian and Arabic speakers, Druze, these are not Jews, these are Druze, Arabic speakers and others. During the past century, Hebrew has become the primary mode of communication in all domains of public and private life in Israel. You can do everything in Israel in Hebrew. In fact, it's the only official language, as I said before. Now, if you travel, who has been to Israel? Who has been to Israel? Maybe a third or a quarter. If you remember the signs, I like, like talking about landscape, linguistic landscape. So landscape is when you see a mountain, you see a river. Landscape with a G is what is the language landscape. So you see signs. Usually they are in English. Look at Israel there. Hebrew and Arabic. So the sign, the, the uh, writing that you see there is in Arabic. You know that in Hebrew we write from right to left, right? Not from left to right. But where is Hebrew from? You see, Hebrew is a language that was spoken not by Abraham. Abraham did not speak Hebrew. But it starts around Moses, the Ten Commandments. We talk about Hebrew as a mosaic language. Mosaic meaning from Moses, not just mosaic as in uh, kind of uh, art. It continues Canaanite, which is here, you can see, which continues Central Semitic, which continu continues West Semitic, which continues Afroasiatic. Now, if I ask you about Jesus, what did Jesus speak? He did not speak Hebrew as his mother tongue. He spoke Aramaic. How do I know that? Because Jesus, by the way, Aramaic has a little to do with Arabic. It's much closer to Hebrew. Aramaic and Hebrew are sisters, but they're not the same. How do I know that he spoke Aramaic and, not, and his mother tongue was Aramaic and not Hebrew? Because he says two things. Firstly, he says, Talitha kumi, young girl or young woman, wake up. Had he spoken Hebrew, he would have not said Talitha, which is Aramaic for young woman. He would have said Nara. The other thing he says, Eli, Eli, Elama Shibaktani. So, God, God, why have you forsaken me? Shibaktani in Aramaic means forsaken. Had he spoken Hebrew, he would have not said Shibaktani. He would have said Azavtani. So, we know, according to these two sentences, that he was an Aramaic native speaker, native Aramaic speaker, rather than native Hebrew speaker. So what happens at the time of Jesus? As you can see in Jesus himself, Hebrew is in decline. Because the Aramaic language, a little bit like French in Europe, say 100 years ago, you know, French was the important language, not English. Now it's English. Aramaic was taking over Hebrew. And in fact, Hebrew became a sleeping beauty or a dreaming beauty or whatever metaphor you want to call it, in 135 AD. Is there anybody who knows what happens in 135 AD? 
135 AD is a very important date. There is one Jew, <coughs> yeah? Very good. What was the name of the Jew who was killed in Beital? Bar Kochva. Yeah, Bar Kochva. Very good. So Bar Kochva is killed. He is symbolically the last Jew who spoke Hebrew natively. From 135 AD until 1886, which is approximately 1,750 years, nobody speaks Hebrew as a native language. Rather, when you go to the shul, shul means synagogue, you pray in Hebrew. A little bit like some uh, Christians, they might say, they, they might pray in Latin, like the Pope says that he knows Latin, yeah, you know. But it's not a living language. That's what happened to Hebrew since 135 AD. Eliezer ben Yehuda, who was mentioned in this uh, video clip that Mike presented us, was in my view a monomaniac. What's a monomaniac? A person who is crazy for one thing. For example, you might know people who are crazy for chocolate or are crazy for one cause. I don't know, it can be anything. Monomaniac means that you are so obsessed that you do not allow your child, as you heard, to socialize with other children because you want them to be the first native speaker of revived Hebrew. So just as Bar Kochva was the last native speaker of Hebrew, Itamar ben Avi, or the grandfather of the guy that we've just seen, Professor Itamar Raz, was the first native speaker of revived Hebrew, 1886. Why? As you heard, that Yezabin Yehuda arrives in Israel 1881. What was he? He was not a linguist. He was a political scientist. He understood something very, very important, that in order to have nationhood, you need three components, three. Lens is a Jewish heritage. They didn't mention it in the film because it's kind of taken for granted, but it shouldn't be taken for granted. You need to have people who say every year, next year in Jerusalem. This is something that every Jew says on Passover, next year in Jerusalem. So my great, 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 great grandparent said next year in Jerusalem. I've done my DNA and I'm a Kohen from 3,500 years ago from Israel. So Kohen is the one that does like that. Yeah, that's a Kohen. Sh means Shaddai, which means God. So Sh is the letter. You can see this also in the films um, by Leonard um, Nimoy. Uh, Leonard Nimoy, is it? Because he's a Jew and he was asked by the director to come up with a sign and he was a Kohen, so he came up with this. If you speak Klingon or Klingon, you also need to do that because of the Kohen. This is because, this is why. So the lens was there, Jewish heritage. This is why Ben Yehuda felt Jewish. Land was the return to Zion, that's Zionism. And Ben Yehuda understood that there is no nationhood without language. So lens, land, lang. Lens, land, language. He was not a linguist. He was a politician. The revival of Hebrew was actually a political, ideological uh, way to secure the future, language, the future state, which is only from 1948. Why did Itamar Ben Yehuda start talking in 1886? He was born in 1882. He was four when he started producing the first word. Now, there are many children here. I'm sure that most of you started talking when you were one and a half or one, two. Is there anybody who started talking when he was four? No? Is there anybody who started speaking when he was four? It's too late. Why did he start when he was four? Because he was not allowed to meet other children. And he was kind of traumatized. And he started speaking when Eliezer ben Yehuda came and noticed that his wife was singing a lullaby to Itamar in Russian. God forbid. Eliezer ben Yehuda took the table that he had, it's a true story, and he threw the table on the floor because he was a monomaniac, I told you, and the table became like many, many pixels, and ben Yehuda, Itamar was so traumatized that he shouted, Abba, you know, like daddy, or a little bit like Abba is Aramaic. Yeah, you can see the ah at the end. Aramaic as opposed to Hebrew, it's very simple. 
In Hebrew, Av means father. In Aramaic, Abba. In Hebrew, Lechem means bread. In Aramaic, Lachma. In Hebrew, Ani means uh, poor. In Aramaic, Aniya. You always put the definite article, the the at the end. This is Aramaic. So Lechem, Ha Lechem Ha Ani in Hebrew, Lachma Aniya in Aramaic. So you can actually see that Jesus' language and Hebrew, the Hebrew language, which is my mother tongue, are actually very related as opposed to Arabic, which is different, although it is related too. Eliezer ben Yehuda was the creator of Hebrew as a modern language, and he said, as you heard, there are things without which the Jews cannot be a nation, the land, and the language. So he believed in a trinity, not il padre, il figlio, il spirito santo, as they say in Italy, rather the trinity. I know that Christadelphians do not believe in trinity. He did not believe in the, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He believed in lens, land, and language. That was his trinity. So how did Eliezer ben Yehuda work it all out? It was very difficult to revive a sleeping beauty language, you need three components. Firstly, resilience. This is your humble servant with Muhammad Ali. Do you know Muhammad Ali? I don't know if the young ones know, but he is the best boxer ever. And if you know anything about boxing, he was a great athlete. He was not a rocky knockouter. He didn't knock you out and you were dead. He was actually there for the long run. When you revive a language, you need to have the resilience, the perseverance. It's not easy because you are not a native speaker and you want your children to be native speakers. It's totally different. It's a totally different kettle of fish. It's a little bit like moving to another country, except that in the new country, you already have native speakers who speak, who speak that language, whereas here you don't have native speakers who speak this language. So there are some migrants here, I know. You came here, say, from a, lang from a language overseas, you had to learn Australian or English, but you had all the Aussies speaking around you, so you could just imitate them. Eliezer Benyota did not have it. He was the one who had to speak to them. So resilience is very hard. Resources, it's a necessary condition for language reclamation. Luckily, Jews had many resources. The most important resource, as I see it, is the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, but there was another resource. It's the Talmud. The Talmud consists of two components. The Gemara, which is in, oh, the Mishnah, which is in Hebrew, Mishnah, and the Gemara, which is in Aramaic. So you can actually look at the Mishnah, which is from the second century AD, in order to find words that you might want to use today. Of course, the word for pistol, you couldn't find in the Mishnah, but you could find the word Ekdah, which in the Bible, which means something like a beautiful stone, but also from Kadaha, which means to drill. So Ekdah in Hebrew today means a pistol. If you were unlucky, like some southerners in Adelaide today, they don't have electricity. So how would you call electricity in Hebrew? I mean, obviously in the Mishnah there is no electricity. It's second century AD. But there is a word Hashmal, which was translated into Greek as ember or amber, which is, which is electra, which is related to electricity. You know, because the ancient electricity might have been from, from amber, you know, like the stone. So chashmal is a word for electricity in Israel. So today I spoke to my friend in Israel and said, yeah, Adelaide has some parts with no chashmal, no electricity. It's a word from the Bible. But of course it did not mean exactly that in the Bible. This is how Ben Yehuda worked. He took the Bible and the Mishnah and he used words in order and infused them with new meanings in order to survive in Israel today. And of course you need immersion. Now what is immersion? It, I'm not talking about baptism. Immersion in Israel has a form called Ulpan. Ulpan is a studio, literally, when all the migrants from all over the world come to Israel, they go to a special club, school, which is called Ulpan. In this school, they're not allowed to speak any other language, any language other than Hebrew. It's a little bit like the monomaniac idea of Eliezer ben Yehuda, don't allow him to speak to other people who do not speak Hebrew, except that now you have many people who speak Hebrew. This immersion resulted in a very good success of Israelis speaking Hebrew. Itamar ben Yehuda, as I said, is the first 
native speaker of Hebrew after 1,750 years. And this is the miracle of the Hebrew revival. The fact that, that after 1,750 years, you have a speaker of a language that used to be the language of Isaiah. Mike mentioned Isaiah at the very beginning. Isaiah, of course, spoke in Hebrew. And then you have Itamar, and then you have your humble servant, whose mother tongue, humble servant means me, yeah, of course. I mean, this is, um, and, um, and uh, yeah, when I looked at um, uh, this guy here, Muhammad Ali, I just realized that I am taller than Muhammad. And he's 191, and I'm 189. I don't understand how it is possible. Something is wrong. But I've just noticed when I looked at it that I'm taller than, I think that it's because he got um, a little bit um, old. And when you get old, you kind of uh, shrink. And uh, I was at my best. Now, and, and does it shrink you, Parkinson? Yeah, you're right. You're right, you're right. You're right, that's true. He had Parkinson. In fact, I have to tell you something about this encounter. He tried to make me a Muslim, but he did not succeed. <laughs> but because he was Muslim at the time. I would like to end and to open the floor for questions because I would be very happy to answer any question you have about uh, revived Hebrew, about Hebrew, about Arabic, about the way you write Hebrew. Um, with two Australian signs. One of them is bad and one of them is good. This is the bad one. I received a ticket. I parked on the left and I don't know whether it was justified or not. This is in Sydney. You have many, many signs. I proposed a pageant uh, before yesterday. Oh, yesterday, sorry. Um, you have many, many signs that change. But this is the beautiful sign of Australia. I found it in, in Victoria, but sometimes it exists in South Australia as well. I reanalyzed the sign as stop. Eliezer Ben Yehuda stopped at the age of, well, uh, he was born 1858, so it's 2, 22, tw at the age of 23, he moved to Israel. At the age of 23, he moved to Israel, he stopped his life, he decided to revive the ancient language of Isaiah, and this is how he ensured that the Jewish existence, at least in Israel, survived. So without that language, I don't know how successful Israel would have been as a Jewish state. So this sign, Stop, Revive, Survive, when I saw it many years ago, the first time I came to Australia, I decided to take a photo, and this is when I decided to become a revivalist. Revivalist in the sense of language revivalist. So what I'm doing these days, I apply lessons from the Hebrew revival to the reclamation of other languages, because it is possible to learn from Eliezer Ben Yehuda and his peers and to apply lessons from that revival, which is so far the most successful revival of any language that we are aware of, to apply lessons from that to the reclamation and empowerment of other languages. And therefore, I come back to the original thing that I told you, if you're interested in languages like Bangala, etc., I've brought you some um, non-tax paid um, uh, uh, booklets. With this, I would like to open the floor for questions. Mike, and thank you. Um, I might just, uh, when, uh, Gilad, when they ask a question, if you could repeat it in the microphone for all those, because there's a lot tuning in online. So I'll have to just repeat it in the microphone. Um, so it is open for questions. I might get the ball rolling by just asking a question that's always sort of not bothered me, but I was interested to know what the answer is. You said Hebrew goes from right to left. I know it's not the only language that does that, but it, it seems as though it's one of the most ancient languages that does it. Is there a reason why yeah. right to left? That, that's, a, that's a wonderful question, and I will tell you something. It's, it's actually related to something that is happening here in Australia, and uh, I will explain what I mean. So the reason that Hebrew is from right to left has to do with the original way of writing. So the original ray, way of writing was actually carving on stone. Now, how many of you here are left, left-handed? One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's a very small percentage, seven. There was one left-handed child in the film. I was very surprised. I don't know if you noticed that. He, uh, they wrote in Hebrew like that. Most people are right-handed. 
when you write on stone, of course it's much better to write from right to left. You understand why? But when you write with an ink, it's much better to write the English way. As evidence, when I was a child, I'm a right-handed person, I was always dirty, dirty here, because in, his, in Hebrew you have to write like that. Whereas in English you write like that, you're not dirty, you understand? So, I mean, these days they don't write anymore, I understand, but uh, when we wrote, it was like that. So this is why to carve on stone you need to write from right to left, and to write with ink from left to right. Now, in Chinese, in some other languages, you can write from top down, and the reason is the, the papyri, or, you know, like the, the trees. If you write on, on a tree, it's better to write like that, if you think of a, of a tree. Yeah? I mean, you don't, you don't write like that. You have to... Now, I'll tell you something very interesting. There was a research that was conducted by some friends of mine about an American and Israeli and an Aboriginal guy from Tukuuk Tayora, which is Cape York Peninsula. I spent some time there. It's near Torres Strait Islands uh, on the northern, uh, eastern, east, north, yeah, northern, eastern, northeastern most point of Australia. So there. And what they did, they took some photos and they, for example, somebody finding a banana, somebody peeling the banana, somebody eating the banana, throwing away the peels of the banana, and they shuffled, they shuffled the, the cards. And then they asked the person, can you put them in order? They went to America and they put one, two, three, four, five. This is all un subconscious, un you know, subconscious. So the reason is that in the Americans they write from right to left. They went to Israel, they put the order one, two, three, four, five, which is why we in Israel write, yeah? Like from right to left. Now, they went to Kuuk Tayor. Guess what happened? Anybody? How did they write? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kuuk Tayor always put the cards subconsciously from east to west. So it's like one, two, three, four, that's the north. And they always know where the north is. And the reason is that in their language, there is no left and there is no right. There is only northeast, sorry, northeast, southwest. And they always put it from east to west. If they were, for example, here, they would have put it up, uh, so from up down. This is why I said sometimes. So it's like one, two, three, four, because it's always east to west. It doesn't matter where they are. Whereas a, an Israeli would always put it right to left. And, and Aussie would always look, put it, I mean, an English-speaking Aussie, left to right. So it's actually a very good question that Mike asked me about why we write this way, because this influences the entire way we think, even when they give us cards to put them in order. So this is why I'm very interested in many different languages, because it changes the way that you think. I mean, these uh, Aboriginal people, they have no idea how they do it. It's only the linguists who discover. They have no idea that they do it from east to west. It's just a, a neutral gender. How many languages have a neutral gender? Look, I have, I have never counted how many, but I can tell you that neutral gender, so I, I'll just explain to those who do not know what it means. Um, in some languages, you have gender. For example, in Italian, the word for table is feminine. The word for chair is feminine. Mm -hmm. But the word for, uh, say, a dream is masculine. Uh, namely, tavola, sedia, sogno. You can see the O at the end. Usually it means it's uh, masculine. In other languages, oh, in Hebrew, you have two genders. Masculine and feminine. For example, the word for Table is masculine, not feminine, like in Italian. And the word for chair is masculine. And the word for dream is masculine, but the word for country is feminine. In some languages, like Ben asked, you have three genders, masculine, feminine, and neutral, which is neither masculine nor feminine, what they call non-specific. For example, 
German. In German, the word for bridge is feminine. Brücke. The word for, say, um, book is neutral. Das Buch. Neutral. The word for baby is neutral because a baby is neither a man nor a woman, so to speak. You know, it's like, oh, das baby. It's like the baby is not yet gendered, so to speak. German is one of them. There are, many other, there are several others, not too many. I don't think that too many languages have gender. For example, Aboriginal languages, of course, do not have uh, that type of gender. I want to make a very good observation here. I mentioned the word bridge. Do you know of a language where bridge is masculine? I mentioned German, it was feminine. Do you know a language where bridge is masculine? For example, Italian, il ponte. For example, Hebrew, gesher is masculine. Another friend linguist of mine conducted a research about how people perceive of a bridge. She asked people, describe a bridge for me. And she discovered something very hard to believe, but it's true. People who came from languages where bridge was feminine described the bridge as elegant, as beautiful. People who came from a language where bridge is masculine described a bridge as sturdy, and as powerful. This was subconscious. In other words, whoever says that the gender does not matter is wrong. Because the gender in languages like German, Italian, Russian, Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, people who come from languages where they have gender, their perception of the object is often determined by whether or not it's masculine or feminine. I don't know about the neutral, because you know neutral is kind of, it doesn't follow into stereotypes. So it's a very interesting phenomenon that gender, which is something that English people usually do not know anything about, because in English, what do you have? Many ships, ships used to be feminine. Like the ship, she is beautiful, yeah? Or sometimes countries, countries, you talk about a country as she, in English, but in English you don't have gender in the um, nouns. In Hebrew you have, you need to decide. Sefer is, sefer is masculine. Machberet, notebook, is feminine. So alpha, beta is an imitation of the Phoenician, of the Hebrew alphabet, which is based on Phoenician. And the reason is very simple. Every word you see, alpha, aleph, Aleph means bull. Aleph means bull, like a bull, like a bull fighting. Bay, bet means house. Gimel means camel. Delet means door. You can actually look at the ancient uh, forms of the alphabet and see a bull, see a house, see a camel, and see a door. What happened with the Greeks, because the Greek alphabet is much younger than Hebrew alphabet, which is based on the Phoenician alphabet. By the way, this is Rosetta Stone. You can find here hieroglyphics, Demotic Egyptian, and Greek. This is how Champollion managed to decipher, because of this stone, the Rosetta Stone and, and the hieroglyphics. And this is why we can read the hieroglyphics today, because of this Rosetta Stone. Only because of that. It's amazing. That's why I made such a tie, which is a linguistic tie. But coming back to your question, the Greek alphabet was invented based on the Phoenician alphabet. In fact, I can show you that the L in Latin is the same L in Hebrew. It's actually the same Lamed. So Lamed is like that in Hebrew. L, and then you go down. So it's Mem, M is similar to Mem, etc. What happened with Greek? 
They took alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, aleph, bet, gimel, dalet, hey. But then what happened was a, a, a name like mine, which used to be Gilad with an ayn, which is a Hebrew sound, not that around in, in uh, revived Hebrew because most speakers of revived Hebrew came from Yiddish, from the Eastern Europe. So they could not say aw. Oh. Can you say aw, oh, aw? Oh. Can you pronounce gilad? Gilad. Usually it's gilad, as if it's Julia gilad. Gilad, yeah, but it's gilad. The Greeks took the ein, and instead of ein that they don't need, they don't have these guturals, they made a, an omicron, which is an o. O. Why? Because in Semitic languages like Hebrew, you don't have vowels. When I write Hebrew, I don't need to write the vowels. The Bible has no vowels. You need to know in advance the word in order to pronounce it. Otherwise, you don't know how to pronounce it. So they took the ein, which is a guttural, and they make an omicron out of it. So omicron, as in the pandemic, uh, dampanic, moronic omicron, yeah, omicron. Yeah, I'm using the same, the same letters, like pandemic, dampanic, omicron, the same as moronic, you know. So omicron is actually an ein. An ein, you write like that, an ein, and then you just get the, the circle out of it. So the letter O in Greek, omicron, O, is based on the letter ein in Hebrew. So it's not all like aleph, alpha, bet, beta, gimel, gamma. Sometimes it's complicated. Because in Greeks, they did not have the ha, the ta, the so, the o. The, they didn't have that. But on the other hand, they needed e, a, o, u, e. E, e, a, o, u. They needed it, and we didn't have it in Hebrew. In Hebrew, there are no letters for e, e, a, o, u, for the vowels. So they used the gutturals, the a, ta, ha, you know, anabhibak in Arabic means I love you, with ha. If you expect to rate as an Arab, you need to learn to expectorate. To expectorate is to get your <laughs> <laughs> This is to expectorate. <laughs> so you, actually this is a sound. It sounds like I'm going to spit, but actually it is a sound. So um, the, uh, the, the, it's a very kind of clever way of using. Now in Russian, as you know, they have the sh. The sh is from Hebrew. They just put sh. And this is how they pronounce sh. Like Sharansky is a sh with a Sharansky is a very famous prisoner of Zion who arrived in Israel uh, after he was jailed in uh, by the by the Soviets for many many years, and then they m made him arrive in Israel. I love shift happening in language. Without shift, without change happening. I would have been unemployed <laughs> because linguists love evolution of language. In fact, you might argue that G God created the linguist. You know the Tower of Babel. You know the story. So according to Genesis, the, the people built a skyscraper. And then God said, oh, what kind of arrogant bastards, you know, are these people? Sorry for the B, B word. Uh, I'm going to mix their language. This is the beginning of linguistics. So the Tower of Babel is a story of diversification of language. What you're talking about is that in Scotland, they might say, that's a, you know, I have a Scottish friend who went to Canada and suddenly the car stopped. There was a huge animal in the middle of the, of the road, and he asked, what is this? He said, that's a moose. I said, no, that's not a moose. A moose is, you know, because in Scotland, <laughs> moose is a mouse. It's the original pronunciation, <laughs> moose. But we, because of the great vowel shift in English, which happened because of a pandemic, not this pandemic, but the um, bubonic plague in 1347, 1349, you had many, many, you know, half of Europe was killed. Half, half of Western Europe was killed. And many upper class Brits ended up living with lower class Brits. And this resulted in a huge change of English. And this is why when you write English, you actually write it totally differently from what you pronounce it. For example, the word sign, S-I-G-N, you write it with a G. Why? 
or the word psychology, you write with a P, or the word no, you write with a K. Why? And the word mice, you write M-I-C-E, which was actually pronounced mis. M-I-C is mis. And the word, for example, name, you write N-A-M-E, which is nam, like in German name, der Name. That was the original pronunciation. Why do you write name N-A-M-E? You should write it differently, right? N-E-I-M, or name. The reason is that this pandemic, which was like six, 600 years ago, it changed the entire language. And therefore, of course, after Hebrew is revived, firstly, it's not identical to what it used to be. Absolutely. For example, as I said, Gilad becomes Gilad. Gilad is pronounced Gilad. Different pronunciation. Tesiso, meatball, is pronounced Ktsitsa. Tesiso, Ktsitsa. It's different. But of course, what you see now is evolution of the revived Hebrew language. So an Israeli today would find it hard to understand the Hebrew from Shai Agnon, who is a Nobel laureate, because he wrote in a very kind of Mishnaic, high-level Hebrew. And there is nothing wrong with that. I mean, just as you said, you cannot understand Chaucer unless you study English, as in Chaucerian English. How many people here can read easily even Shakespeare? Shakespeare spelled his surname in five different ways, none of which was S-H-A-K-E-S-P-E-A-R-E. -E -E. He was not dyslexic. It's just that at the time, first, nobody cared about spelling, as opposed to the spelling bee today. And secondly, the spelling was totally different. So shift happening is wonderful for me. There are people who say, no, 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 these, no, no, no is in Hebrew from Yiddish, like bad, you know, no, no, no. By the way, Yiddish is everywhere. Like in America now, they call the voters me voters, M-E-H. Me, me, me voters, meaning I don't care, me. You know, Biden doesn't, I'm indifferent to Biden. I'm called me voters. You can Google it, M-E-H, it comes from Yiddish. So there are some people who say, no, 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 then the young Israelis, you should learn properly to speak like Isaiah, etc., etc. But as you perspicaciously realize, the young people change the language. And the most important people for linguists are the young people, not the old people. Because the young people are the ones who drive the change. So if you want to know what will Australian English sound like in the future, you don't ask the old people, you ask the young people. It's obvious, isn't it? I see there are many young people here. So the vowels are by and large the same because we know from context which word it was, and therefore we know how to pronounce. But there are several vowels that do not exist. For example, in Hebrew, there was a difference between kamatz and patach. Patach is like that, and kamatz is like that. Patach is just one, and kamatz is like that. Patach was a. Kamatz was o. Do you, do you hear the difference between a and o? A little bit like other Iranian people here, like some Persians, they have o, you know. A and o. In Hebrew, in revived Hebrew, it's just a. So there is no difference. The same with two dots, tsere and segol, three dots. It was e and e, but now we just say e. A little bit like that happens in Italian. In Italian, I speak Italian of the South, so I can say modo, modo, which means a mo, um, like a manner, modo. It comes from Latin modus. Mo is open and do is closed. But in Milan, which is a city in the northern part of Italy, as you know, they just say modo, modo, like the same o, modo. They don't say modo. The same happens in many languages that you have you lose some distinctions, so to speak. You already lost them in revived Hebrew. That's a very good point. But I know that the word Bereshit at, at the beginning was pronounced Bereshit and not Bereshit or Bereshit or, because I know the, the grammar. So don't forget one thing. Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible was, let's say from, mm, the earliest time is 500 BC, earliest probably 1000 BC. The vocalization, 900 AD. 
So the, Tiber the Tiberius people, they added the vowels to the Bible 1,400 years after the Bible was written. How did they know? Because Jews went to the synagogue or whatever it was, like the temple, and prayed orally for 1,400 years and the children heard and from every generation it went down, 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 down until 1,000. It's actually an amazing story as well. Not just the revival of Hebrew, which we are talking about today, but also the addition of the vows to the original Old Testament, which happened 1,400 years later, at least. You understand? At least. Probably it's more like 1,900 years later. So I'm giving you a book today, and 2,000 years later, you add the vowels, because the book does not have vowels. It's remarkable. But I can tell you that, as a generalization, the vowels that they added are correct. Whether, whether or not there is a mistake, of course there could be a mistake. Absolutely. And this is why you have philologists who are working through it and say, oh. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.